The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, theologian Dr. Cherith Fee Nordling explains how Jesus' humanity shows us what it means to be truly human. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Thanks for being with us again. Thank you. Uh, you also, you're actually working on two books. Yes. Uh, or they're in final stages of production. One, the second one is with uh, InterVarsity Press. Yes. Could you tell us about that one? Yes, it's less than final um, hmm. as far as InterVarsity is concerned, but I would love to tell you about that. It's a book that um, has sort of come into being because of the kinds of conversations that I've had with students over these last seven or eight years um, with some of the concerns that I began to discover were um, deeply um, problematic in my own receiving um, the life of Jesus for me. Uh, it was always this idea that I kept trying to cling to instead of someone that I really knew who I could really see as that person standing for me. And so it's a book that um, I think is really emerging out of some very lively conversation and, and maybe that's a good way that books get written. Sometimes I'm wondering why theologians ever write books. It seems like we've already said everything. And this book, again, won't be anything new, but it will be a revisiting of why the humanity of Jesus actually matters. Um, and I, I think that has come out of conversations with um, students where either they have such a deeply um, held sense of Jesus' divinity that the idea that he truly is like us, let alone continues to be like us, um, as we will be, is very hard for them to believe and to trust, let alone to try to get their heads around. And the opposite extreme is that somehow then his humanity become something that they keep trying to generalize so that he just becomes the person that we can kind of retrofit into all of our own experience instead of his life really being what it is, which is that my life isn't your life and your life isn't my life and his life isn't my life either. It really is his life that he has lived. And the conversation that started to generate some of this um, came around, I think, the recognition of students realizing that they had a deep ambivalence about their own humanity and that God was sort of as we would discuss God being one who was really about saving their whole person. They were very quick to discover that they weren't really so sure that they wanted their whole person saved. And by whole person you mean? I, 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 to use like the fun phrase that Karl Barth will do when he tries to sort of talk about us as um, embodied souls He'll, the very next sentence, use the term and sold bodies or sold bodies because he doesn't want us to see one prioritizing the other. He's just, to be a person is somebody who is constituted this way, that there is, there is no way for us to be the deep inner core soul person that we are that does not have its physical male or female manifestation. This is what it means to be Cherith. There's no other Cherith who's trapped in this body or currently taking up residence in this body, embodied Cherith as her deepest person is all there is. And yet I'm not just my body, that there's something that is deeply core um, that remains um, in terms of who I am um, with my new body that it, it, we're sort of landing in territory that's almost hard to describe. And so Bart just plays those terms off of one another. And what I discovered is that much like myself when I was younger, and then through the course of having to deal with um, illness in my life and, and other ways of just not, not really taking my own body seriously, the limitations that it had, the struggles that I have, the, the taking my femininity and my femaleness seriously in relation to men and women, um, realizing that I had spent a lot of my life growing up in the church sort of neutering myself because I grew up in a household of all boys and had a mother who grew up in a household of all boys. And 
So it was just kind of try to be one of the boys. And I was in worlds in my many years in the law firm or in the church or the academy that are mostly male dominated worlds. And so to not use my femaleness in an um, inappropriate way, I just always pretended I didn't have any. And so I was like, well, this is just my shell, but the real me is this person who you really want to know. And to realize that that was very unfaithful to the gospel, let alone very unfaithful to real human relationships, and forced me to not take responsibility for um, myself and what my sons were learning about how to honor women and men well and how to help them talk through some of those kinds of things. And so as I had relationships with students also who were just going, I'm not sure that I can get past the shame of my embodied life, or I'm 20 and I'm a very uh, healthy male, and I don't know how to think about women in a way that thinks about them in an embodied sense that doesn't trip me up or get me caught. And I can't wait to get to heaven and not have a body and not have to worry about how to think about stuff like this. And, and to just start realizing, oh my goodness, instead of people who, who follow an incarnate Lord in freedom, we are very quietly Gnostic in a way that tries to sort of negate our humanity and then we let Jesus be a lot more docetic or the Jesus who just sort of shows up in human form or, or fills a human body, whatever these ancient heresies are, whether it's you know, Polynarianism or these different kinds of terms that came from people in the church trying to relieve the tension of saying that this one is the God-man, that this one is Yahweh in the flesh. And because those things were so hard to hold together, these heresies, which always happen inside the community of faith, outside they are just something completely other, but it's within the community of faith going, let's make him a little more human and a little less divine so that we can trust that what he did, he really did as an authentic human being, because otherwise it's God just taking over his will and his mind. Or on this side going, yeah, but we know that the material world actually isn't very good, and God would never taint himself to really, really be like me. So I think he just used that sort of human form and poured himself into it and then just got rid of it as soon as he could. And most of us don't get walked through those kinds of heresies that were really lively debates in the life of the church in the early first centuries. They were always trying to figure out, have, we're trying to say this thing, have, have, we, have we said it faithfully enough without locking it down? Because we can't lock this thing down and really get our heads around it, but we know that we must say that he is God and that he is truly a man. And so as I would sit in class and watch us sort of study these things and ask my students to say, okay, go back to your church background and tell me which of these heresies is the most common in your youth group, which is the most common that you think happens in the worship life of your hymnody. Where do we tell the story about Jesus in a way that releases the tension and actually causes us to see him as two people so he's the divine son, and then he's Jesus Nazareth, and somehow they got crazy glued together, and well, that's another heresy, and just all the ways that the church was trying to go, what can we actually say? And realize if we give even the slightest bit on either side of those, the story falls apart. We don't have God present to us, and I can't really trust that my humanity is redeemed and whole and kept in the very presence of God by somebody who knows my story intimately and is for me in that story, not in, in spite some of future story. life. And in spite of it, and actually heals that story, you know, becomes the person who enters the human condition and becomes my lived healing by his very life. So lots of really on the ground questions you deal with, you know, young adults, and they are trying to sort it out. So it's like, how do you not fantasize sexually about somebody as somebody who's really trying to follow Jesus and who would take a lead from Jesus on this and to trust him about what does it mean to let this man or woman, whether you're a man or woman who's doing this, let them become a person again. How would you do that? Instead of let them be an object, which is what your culture is constantly asking you to do, is to objectify them and to depersonalize them for your gratification or for them to sell you something or whatever else is going on. How do you become one who really is an image bearer of God, 
restores their personhood without pretending that you're not a man who is aroused by them or a woman who is aroused by that man. And so how do you become obedient in your humanity, which is very different than pretending you don't have any. And so we would really engage in some of these very deep questions. And in the process of doing that, I asked them to begin to um, hand in things, assignments that became reflections that were not prose. They weren't written papers. They had to be things that showed me in some other form. I didn't give any restrictions around what it had to be. Both their own body map and, and a God map, just sort of, not that you can completely categorize either yourself or God, but how, through a tiny little lens, how do you see yourself right now? What is your sense of your embodied person and how do you see God? And realizing how deeply far apart these were because the incarnation wasn't the way that they saw God first. God was the big faraway God or the wrathful God or the confusing God or the God that you hoped liked you most of the time. And, and so I remember one student um, handing in her God map and she gave me a bottle of oil and balsamic vinegar. And she, the instructions were to just shake it up as hard as I could. And she said, for that one instant that it looks like these things are held together. She said, the oil for me represents the goodness of God and the, the vinegar represents to me the wrath of God. And I can't figure out how to hold those things together and trust that he really loves me because I have this deep sense of his wrath. And she says, I could hold it for just about as long as those things look like they're mixed. And then to look at her own way then of perceiving herself by the kinds of things that she would draw or paint or construct to realize, wow, the, the fact that we have a very um, poor sense of Jesus' embodied life for us has deep ramifications for the fact that these students would confess within these works that they would do their addictions, their self-mutilation, their um, sexual abuse that became part of their past story that they just never felt like they could be released from, all kinds of issues that just felt like they carried this with them and they had no idea how to be that embodied human and trust that that was good news, that God had loved that person and loves that one and pulls that person, me, this way into the divine fellowship and in the process of doing that the very word of of acceptance and, re and receiving me is a word of reconciling and a word of restoring and healing already before God, all that that's broken. It's me who bears the effects of my brokenness, who has not yet seen what I look like when I'm finished, but he does. And to realize that the parts that I don't know what to do with in my brokenness, he also sees through his son and his son mediates as my high priest and the spirit who intercedes for me, that the anguish of being caught still in the already and the not yet, um, and yet the empowerment and the, the worship and the joy that, that Jesus offers on my behalf and that the spirit offers on my behalf. So this book is really trying to get to the core of why Jesus' humanity matters every day so that issues of justice do not become um, topics of interest. You know, if it, I happen to be somebody who's all about social justice or I'm all about creation care or I'm about, you know, immigrant um, issues or I'm about this or I'm about that. I just say, actually, if you are a human image bearer who is already being called to enact the future that's coming, where God's justice and reign and the flourishing of creation is finally just the way it is, where you finally get your life back and so does everything else according to Romans 8, that you are already the, the person that creation is like holding on by its fingertips waiting for the glory of the children of God to be revealed because once we get our lives back, so does everything else. And when Paul just keeps going with that metaphor, he says, and what is the redemption? What is this glory? What is this thing that you anticipate? It's the redemption of your body. It's that you're going to get your life back and you're going to be whole. You're not going to be broken and screwed up anymore. And imagine relating to your husband and, and really loving him the way you want to instead of the way you do, Cherith. And 
And those, those are my biggest dreams and joys is to think, I will really love people the way I want to. I will really stop defending and, and hiding for fear that people will not really love me if they really knew me. There will be a transparency in relationships that I cannot wait for. And yet at the same time, I think we have been called as a people to begin to practice resurrection. As Wendell Berry would say, we are people who are called to begin to enact for the sake of the world the story that we're in so that they see both what's already going on and where this finally ends up as a sort of new beginning in, in this final restoration of all things. So in a sense, it has a very practical aspect. On the other hand, it allows the chance to kind of go into some of these um, very fascinating and wonderful, lively church conversations. These weren't academic conversations, these heresies or these creedal constructs. These were, what do people say when they get baptized? You know, what do we mean when we invite people into the life of God and to be followers of Jesus into this new creation. What are we actually saying? And that, you know, one side of the pond would find themselves saying one thing and somebody else over here saying another and say, when we say these things, how are we trying to articulate in short form in a, in a little confession or a creed that somebody will say, I believe this whole big narrative story and here are the bullet points. And to realize that those became life and death conversations in some ways. It, you know, you change that one word by this letter and it means something completely different and it's an iota of difference. And you're saying either Jesus is God or he's just sort of like God, but not really God. And so these were deep conversations with deep ramifications in the everyday life of the community of the saints back then. And I think they still are. We just, we are sort of un practiced and unlearned at thinking through the implications of who Jesus really is. And, and I speak for myself and my own church traditions. It's very easy to keep going back to the familiar and just saying what we know without going into the part that's harder to say because we aren't really able to nail down that. We just know what we need to profess, what we're called to bear witness to, what we're called to say and worship and say, at this stage, I fall into doxology and worship and praise because I can't explain it as a creature child. I just have to celebrate it because it defines everything about my life. So I look forward to seeing how this book finally comes into its um, final stages. But, but it's also then a book about what does it mean to really walk by the power of the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to walk as people who are not just to model, which is actually never the word, um, to somehow look at Jesus as some figure that I'm always supposed to look at and try to copy, which is impossible in my own strength and impossible to understand. But to say, no, what would it mean to actually really be joined to what he's doing, which is always about justice, always about the restoration of creation, always about the care for the poor and the alien and the stranger, always for the other, always on the side of all these things, because all of these things are already under his reign and his rule. And if they're already all mattering to him, and he would like to actually have something to say and do about them, where would he look but to his human image bearers where he would say, this is what I'd like to do about this today. Cherith, would you like to participate with me? Would you like to play? You know, Mike, this is what I'd like to do. And sometimes it will look astounding because healing will break in. New creation will already break through the, I think Tom Wright talks about sort of like a breaking through the concrete of the old creation comes this sort of grass of new life. It will look like that sometimes. And other times it's that constant sense in, in Paul and Peter and John where it's the call to be filled with the Spirit in order to actually walk this incredibly challenging witness and to walk in these places where God really wants to go, which is in the place of suffering, to walk into the places that he has claimed as his own, which is to stand with people in their pain and to make their need my need and to endure the suffering that's part of my own life instead of rail against God or run away from it. To say, he promised that I would participate in the fellowship of his glory, but glory for him, according to John 12, 
starts when he turns his face to Jerusalem and begins that final week of his life. It says, and then Jesus was glorified. I thought, well, then glory and participation in the fellowship of his suffering, sorry, participation in the fellowship of his suffering, these things are not one or the other. And it's not, well, I want some glory, so I guess I'm going to have to have a little suffering because Jesus suffered. I think Jesus has been trying to turn this around for me and say, Cherith, I suffered because you did. I've entered into your situation. I knew what was coming for you. I know the human condition. I knew you would have this. And the only way for your story to turn out with a different ending than having that suffering be the final word is to enter into your suffering and take it and heal it and redeem it so that when you are in the midst of it, you see it as a participation in the fellowship of mine and you know the outcome. And you know that I can empower you to endure that just as the Father by the Spirit empowered me all the way to and through the cross. So it's become a, a very um, earthy conversation in some wonderful ways. And yet I'm hoping by getting the book out there that it will also create a lot more dialogue around some of these issues. The sense of belonging and of, and of being accepted from, from the beginning mm -hmm and knowing that that comes before uh, your life in the Spirit and before measuring up to mm -hmm. anything as though we could measure up to anything it seems to give a sense of freedom to be able to enter into the suffering knowing that it isn't a matter of a, of a fa pass-fail. Right. It's a matter of you're already belonging, you're already accepted, and you're entering into a life that uh, is real mm. and will work out right because it's already been claimed and healed and redeemed. Mm. It makes all the difference. There's uh, so many people fear that, as you said, there, there's a fear of, um, I don't know if I can, can measure up. I don't know, I don't want to embark on a journey I know I can't finish or right. don't believe I can finish or just see failure at the end of every day. Right. And I think that's part of the challenge maybe that just gets addressed in Romans 7 to 8. You know, is to say actually Romans 7 is never Paul's description of the Christian life ever. He's like let's talk about three laws if we're going to use the term law because we get that term because we all used to be under that law. How about just like naming sin and death a law? because it always turns out that way. This is just the way it goes. So we have this law of Torah keeping, we have this law of sin and death that absolutely cannot be true, and we have this new law of the Spirit, as Jeremiah called it, or Ezekiel calls it, Isaiah calls it, and says, to walk under this new law is to be set free from this condemnation that comes with, oh, I thought I would be able to pull it off, and yet again, I blew it. And who will deliver me from this? And, and Paul's going, well, nothing from those two laws will ever deliver you from that. But in the Spirit, every day, by continuing to trust and release and invite God, who you don't have to sort of invite him to be present, it's almost just letting him loose. It's letting him actually have the moment to say, Lord, I, I won't constrict you. I will actually listen to you when you talk to me and stop and and when I've prayed earlier today lead me not into temptation but deliver me from evil when you actually try to do that for me I'm gonna listen to you and and not just go into my default setting or not just go the easiest place of my kind of bentness and to watch over time God begin to take that bentness and sort of straighten it into conformity with his son which is an obedient submission, which is a, what are we doing today? And how do I be part of that? And realize I'll have, I'll have things all through every day that need forgiving, but the Lord already knows that before we got started and before I woke up and he isn't inviting me or not inviting me in based on how well I'm going to do today. I'm just in. You know, he says, as my dad used to say, and still does, he says, God has never been about the business of fitting individuals for heaven. He has been about the business of making a people for his name and presence. And he has done that. He's 
done it through his son and nobody can alter that outcome. Nobody can alter that current reality. So either we can participate in it more and more and sort of get on board with what the possibilities are by our life in the spirit for the other and realize it's not sort of a triumphalism of, ooh, I get more and more power to sort of see things look easier or amazing. Sometimes what looks amazing and gets easier is actually to just keep loving the person who makes you crazy, to love the person who is the most painful person in your life, to love yourself when you're that person who is the most unlovable person, and to watch the power of God begin to enter in as a choice of love over and over and over becomes the, the radical participation in the life of the Holy Spirit that will sometimes look like healing and sometimes look like endurance, will look like suffering long, which is such the character of God for those that he loves, no matter what they do, whether they even recognize that. And I think that's the beauty of the gospel that comes in triune form, is that when Jesus shows up and says, I'd like to introduce you to the Father, and I'd like to give you the life that we have together by the Spirit. The minute that offering is laid out there, there is nothing anyone has done or could possibly do to have earned that invitation. And when he is able to offer that through his own life, there is also nothing anyone can do to run out the, the warranty on that offering. You know, there's nothing where that eternal life insurance policy gets canceled. There's just nothing that can stop that from being the way it is because it's grounded in God, not me. And at the same time, my humanity is absolutely, completely grounded in that because Jesus holds my humanity in his own. So I know how this turns out because he's right there with me. And at the same time, he's saying, well, Cherith, you don't have to wait for then. Would you like to, would you like to be part of what I, what I am doing today in my reigning in my standing in as a priest for the sake of the other before the Lord, would you like to do that? Would you like to be an intercessor on behalf of? Would you like to go minister to the needs of? Would you like to stand for justice because I am the ruler over all things? And that means you have to stop and take the time to say that is not okay instead of just we'll go, well, that's sort of inconvenient for me. Or as an American, I, I feel entitled to it or whatever it is. It's like I am prophet which means that if you want to participate in that, then you need to tell the truth. And you have to be the first person who hears the truth as you tell it, which means that your life has to be conformed to the things that I'm telling you. And so you can be a proclaimer of the gospel because that's what I'm doing, is giving out the good news. You can be an enactor of justice because that's what I'm doing, is restoring all things for life and for good. And I am being your high priest. And if you would like to be among the priesthood of believers, which you are, and actually offer worship through these different ways that I would invite you into this day that looks different than anybody else, and in some ways looks absolutely the same as everybody else every day, then you actually get to be doing what I'm doing until we're finished and you're launched in your sort of whole new way of being human with me. You've been watching You're Included a production of Grace Communion International.